how can you go from ops to DevOps? I get this question a lot. So I've gone out and asked uh, a bunch of colleagues, former colleagues and friends who are in this business to give me their ideas. So what you're getting here is a kind of compiled bunch of advice from a bunch of different people uh, with a bunch of different perspectives and getting it all kind of summarized and tied up into hopefully practical advice. And uh, you know, you, you get just coming out of my sweet, sweet face in video form. But again, it represents a lot of experience from a lot of different people. So if you're in operations right now, my, my aim is for this video to be a kind of roadmap for your skill development and then actually for how to get a job in broad strokes, like A to B. How do you do this? So first, let's talk about the main thing that separates ops and DevOps. Well, yes, but really it's slightly more complicated than that. DevOps involves more automation and software development, but it's not entirely true because a lot of the existing skill set of a good ops person is already Python, bash scripting, automation, like good ops people are already doing that. So just saying, oh, add dev is an oversimplification. For me, one of the key insights is that as a DevOps person, one of your main focuses or mindsets is code first. In many ops roles, you're going to be solving problems and it's going to be an exception for you to spend an entire day or an entire week working on software, writing software, creating a software tool, right? It's the exception. Most of your output is going to be uh, the thing itself. Provision this, create this user, remove this person who's no longer at the company. The output of your work is just the work getting done itself, right? It's a task based kind of thing. For a DevOps position, usually it's the exception when one of your solutions, one of the things you actually deliver is not expressed in code or just deeply involved with your automation or pipeline, a piece of Terraform code or uh, Ansible or Puppet or uh, an actual tool that you write from scratch in Python or some, some other language or a piece of documentation or a series of meetings with another team to kind of teach them how to use the system, the pipeline, the workflow, etc. Very few of the things you work on should, might be specific tasks that are just like, go do this thing, bam, it's done, okay, thanks, take it off the backlog. You are writing code at a company for some value of the word code. That's the essential difference for me. So in your current ops role, this is where you start, <laughs> you gotta start where you are. Uh, start adopting this mindset, right? When you're faced with a manual task, ask things like, can I automate this? How can I make sure that I never have to do this again? How can I improve documentation or training so that uh, this question or this problem never makes it to me again, that someone can solve this themselves? What steps can I take in changing our workflow to obviate this problem entirely so that it never becomes a problem for anyone else, even though the specific thing isn't automated or fixed. It just it doesn't exist as a problem anymore because the workflow is better now. Essentially, you're still doing the same thing you did as an ops person, right? Get as much off your plate <laughs> uh, so that you can go back to playing Counter-Strike in the basement. It's, it's just that you're expressing, you're doing that work differently. The end goal is still, you know, to essentially get out of the way and have things just run without your constant input. So that's the main thing you need to acquire and you can start right now. It's that code first mindset. In a DevOps role, you're not just the ops guy with more scripting. You are the software engineer essentially creating the self-serve operations system that can run without you. You're, some people write the product app, you write the operations app. I'm gonna give you the very short version here. I made a longer version of like a whole video series on the actual DevOps job interview process, which hopefully I will link somewhere here or here or here. Number one, become really good at your scripting language of choice, whether that's Python, if you, if you don't have an opinion on it uh, or something else. Learn Git if you don't use Git already. It's just a popular VCS tool, you should know Git. Everyone should know Git, the basics. I have a video on that too. Obviously learn Linux if you haven't yet. A lot of your work will be on, in, and around Linux. So being very comfortable with that um, is good. And also being able to train developers to use it more effectively can, can be great. Learn one of the major clouds. 
Again, if you're not targeting a specific job role, order I would learn them in would be AWS, Azure, if you wanna be in the Windows world, Google Cloud, really focus on one. If you're on Windows, one of the most direct routes uh, to just get started now would be like WSL, Python, and Bodo. Like, bam, you're creating infrastructure programmatically in the cloud on a free AWS account if, you have, if you've never joined. Uh, there's almost no faster way to just jump in and get started. And you should do that now. And finally, this is the thing that everyone expects from, from DevOps positions. I would say you need, a, you need a pretty good understanding of at least one CI automation tool. If you lack imagination, uh, pick Jenkins. Uh, really just any popular CI tool will do. These are usually gonna be role specific, but again, just aim for the most popular ones and you can adapt quickly. The goal is for you to understand these things quickly. And there's almost no better way to do that than um, the last thing you should learn, which is pretend you're going for a junior developer role in your target environment. For example, Ruby on Rails or Java, whatever it is, learn the skills that you would need as a junior dev and because that's, it's a great way of learning this pipeline for a reason. So write a small web application that forces you to learn all the web development um, libraries that are common, some of the practices that are common, some of the reasons why developers ask you things will become very clear because it's something they do all the time and you didn't realize it until you're writing a web app of your own. You can make meaningful progress in any one of these things in the span of like a week. So dedicate a week here, a weekend there, um, and you can, you can be up to speed, you can be effective pretty quickly, even though, yes, you will not be an expert. But especially getting into that environment that the developers are in, that's what's gonna really help you have the mindset that you need. If, all, if you've checked all these boxes and you just want bonus points, I would add distributed software skills on top of that, like the CAP theorem, uh, consensus algorithms, um, how state is managed, uh, popular strategies for, for doing distributed systems, like the idea of semaphores, how that works, um, you know, locking mechanisms, different mechanisms for controlling what's happening to state for clustered applications, even for clustered, like for data stores, right? Like, like Postgres. Um, that should, you, should, you should have an intuitive grasp of how that stuff works because it's some of the hardest stuff you're gonna be dealing with, um, especially if you go kind of the SRE path. Other bonus things, become good at object-oriented Programming, design, thinking. Sandy Metz's book is still my favorite way of learning this stuff. Um, you know, just become a reasonably good software developer in, in terms of writing software that um, is configured cleanly, that is intuitive to use, uh, and, and try to have this empathy of like, what do people expect from software? It's, it's a very educational thing to do if you're gonna go into a DevOps role. Being good at something and getting a job doing that thing are often very different skill sets, unfortunately, uh, as evidenced by like our entire industry's deeply misguided interviewing practices. Let's talk about how to acquire that, that secondary skill set of actually getting a DevOps job, kind of working it in these kinds of roles if your previous experience is in straight operational roles like Linux engineer or like e even cloud engineer or stuff like that. Okay, so you're ready to actually apply to jobs. Great. Write a cover letter, a good one, and start applying to jobs and customize your cover letter for every single one. If you're really in a rush, uh, you can have kind of a core kind of set of things that you want to say about yourself in that cover letter, but you should be meaningfully, like 20% of that page long cover letter should be adapted to each company that you're applying to. You should really look at them, look at the company, look at the philosophy, look at some videos that they put online about what they're all about and what they care about and what their philosophy is and what their product is. It's a lot of work and a lot of it will feel like wasted effort because you'll never hear back, but it is useful. It's actually how I got my first job. That's why I'm recommending it. Congrats, you're very likely to have a DevOps job soon or at least some interviews. The demand is huge right now. If you have problems, especially if you have problems in a specific stage, uh, like you're not getting any calls back, well, maybe work with a resume coach to tweak your resume. You're blowing the phone interview. Maybe work on whatever kind of having stories ready for the situations they ask you about or 
uh, you know, kind of go through your past experiences and, and get some stories together that demonstrate certain things that you hear being asked about in phone screens a lot. If there's an obvious tech gap where you're blowing the phone screen, like go fill that in. You have no excuse, right? That's the best kind of feedback, the easiest kind of feedback. Um, it can be useful if you're going for a more junior role. One of my colleagues doesn't like that uh, verbiage and I'm kind of, I'm interested to know more about why, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna think about it. Uh, so if you're newer at DevOps and you're going for these kind of more entry level roles, I think working with a recruiter can be really useful because a recruiter has seen a lot of candidates and has seen a lot of people who got hired or didn't get hired and has probably a pretty good intuition if they're a good recruiter and a willingness to help you. They'll edit your resume before they send it off. They usually do. Um, they'll give you feedback on what a company liked or didn't like about you. They will often give you words that you can repeat back to the customer because the customer gave the recruiter the words of what they're looking for. That recruiter gave you the words and now you kind of understand the concepts to use when you're talking to the hiring manager. Um, again, it can be very useful. They can troubleshoot your stuff pretty quickly. So uh, recruiters are not all bad. Okay, so this is the point in the video where I go off on a super passionate like Dave tangent. So if you're not here for the Dave tangent and advice, uh, you know, fast forward a few minutes. Okay, one practical thing I would suggest doing if you are purely in an operations role now and you are trying to go into a DevOps or DevOps E type of role, I would suggest that you learn at least a few of the HashiCorp tools. <laughs> it's actually the other way around. I work at HashiCorp because I really like their tools and I did before I worked there. It's not the other way around, I promise. I'm not just shilling the tools because I happen to currently work at Hashi. I'll give you a few examples. Learning Packer is super useful in your current ops role. It's not like if you don't use it, it's useless to, to gain skill about it in your current role. A lot of these tools are useful in the DevOps world and they're useful to you right now, even in a hardcore, like straight ops, Linux engineering world. Packer, like if you're manually configuring images, you get like a monster bash script doing it, you may be better off starting to put some stuff in Packer and baking it AMIs that way or images. Learning Terraform is useful in almost any ops role, even if your entire infrastructure isn't in Terraform. You can just use it to manage like stray DNS records that you manually manage in some horrible login that like no one remembers the password to. You know, every ops department has like static resources somewhere out there that are third party that probably have a Terraform module available for them. And you can just put those in Terraform. Just start with that. They're tools that can meet you where you are. If you have a little more power, adding something like Vault to just be a service that's running that developers can take advantage of can clean up a lot of your horrible, clean up a lot of your ops code and it can be useful for the developers and then they start using it and then suddenly you have like Vault drying up a lot of code or getting secrets out of a lot of code bases, allowing you to rotate credentials. Oh my God, Vault can actually automatically rotate your Postgres credentials or your whatever database or your cloud credentials without anyone having to update anything in a code base. Like that's amazing. Uh, and then suddenly the dev team's like, oh, this is pretty cool. Oh, maybe we'll store some of our like app secrets in here. And then, oh my God, suddenly you're doing DevOps. Like it's just happening. It just happens naturally. This is why I like these tools because they can meet you over in the ops world. You just set them up or start using them as much or as little as you want. And then they take you by the hand and you can walk with them by the hand over into a DevOps world because they support those DevOpsy workflows where it's really about workflows instead of specific tasks and processes that you have in the ops world. And once you have some of these more structured kind of code bases, I'll call them configuration and code or whatever you want to call it. Uh, once, once you have some of these tools running, it's, it becomes easier to hang more code on them. And because they're not like homegrown Perl monstrosities, it becomes easier to scale up in them, like adding more code doesn't make them harder to use. It just makes them more convenient because now they're managing more of your stuff. So it becomes very easy to migrate to them and they just make your life better. We have better tools for that stuff now. It's not all custom and like Steve wrote it 10 years ago. So we still have to like call him and pay him 250 bucks an hour to like help us debug a thing because 10,000 lines of his code control our ability to deploy to production uh, anymore, right? It's like, these are, these are tools that make it easier to scale, not harder. 
And the crazy thing is some tools make it very easy to scale, but are super complicated. You pay a high price to even start using them. Kubernetes is like this, but these are tools that are easy to start small with and then easier to grow big with. It's like you don't have that high upfront price or the high complexity price once you grow. It's like the best of both worlds. Also DevOps. And that's kind of the beginning of DevOps. Uh, now you just schedule a few DevOps interviews, write a cover letter with all the things that you just implemented that we just talked about at your current role. Uh, maybe schedule a mock interview about DevOps stuff with me at devopsinterview.me, which is totally a real thing that I'm going to have a real launch video for at some point when I get to it. Yes, it's a thing I'm doing. Um, and congratulations, you're a working DevOps professional before you know it. Bam! Right in the name. <laughs> it might be a little too much. <laughs>